So it is our great privilege to have Dr. John Mather with us today in the 26th RBI Technical Webinar Program. So welcome to each and every one of you. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, uh, wherever you're joining from. I'm Anis Rahman, uh, host for this technical webinar where uh, we are extremely fortunate to have Dr. John Mather with us today. So I have just one or two slides for introduction and then uh, we'll go to Dr. Mather's talk. Uh, and the brief program note is uh, that uh, after the brief introduction, Dr. Mather will present his keynote talk and then we'll have open <clears throat> Q&A by uh, moderation. And Dr. Mather doesn't need any introduction, as you all probably know, and of course you know, he's a world-renowned scientist, senior astrophysicist at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And uh, his work on space, uh, James Webb Space Telescope started <clears throat> from the very beginning of the JWST project. And even prior to that, he started working on the uh, Cosmic Background Explorer, Explorer Program, or COBE. And uh, he, he is the principal investigator for the far higher absolute spectrometer uh, on COBE program as well. So with the COBE team, Dr. Mather showed that the cosmic microwave background radiation has a black body spectrum within 50 parts per million. And this is so important as you will learn uh, during his talk, because this confirms the expanding universe model to an extraordinary accuracy. The Kobe team also made the first map of the hot and cold spots in the background radiation showing the anisotropy. And for all of these works, Dr. Mather received the 2006 Physics Nobel Prize, along, along, with, uh, along with George Smoot, and primarily for their discovery of the black body form and anisotropy of the cosmic microwave background radiation. I had a good fortune of meeting him in person um, uh, here at Dickinson University, where among many, 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 many prizes, Dr. Amather has received during his uh, long career. The Priestley Award was also given to him at Dickinson College. And Joseph Priestley, the discoverer of oxygen, uh, actually was uh, a friend of the founder of Dickinson College, where a lot of the original instrument Joseph Priestley used is there housed in, in Dickinson College here in Harrisburg, um, in, uh, in, in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And every year uh, they arrange a Dickinson, um, a Priestley Award program where I had the good fortune of meeting Dr. Mather this year, earlier this year. So without further ado, it's my extreme honor and great privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Mather to you and the floor is your Dr. Mather, please. Oh my goodness, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rahman, for the introduction. Uh, I will now uh, attempt to show my, uh, my view graphs so that uh, you can see my story, but I can't do that yet until, uh, until you let oh, go. Oh, sorry, I, I'm sorry, yeah. Okay, there sorry, go. please go ahead. Okay, one moment, please. Um, and. Uh, it was a pleasure to meet you, and I'm, I'm always delighted to be able to follow up on those kinds of introductions. So, do you see my slides now? Yes. Excellent. So, what I'm showing you here is the picture of the Great James Webb Space Telescope as we imagine it is in outer space, although in reality it would be in darkness and we would not be able to see this picture. What we see is a gigantic golden hexagon 
It is 6.5 meters in diameter. It is made out of 18 smaller hexagons, and that is the primary mirror that collects light from distant stars, planets, galaxies, and the most distant objects we can find in the universe. It's all collected by this gigantic mirror and focused into the instrument package, which is located behind the mirror right in the center. The telescope is protected by a gigantic umbrella. We call it a sunshade. It is made of five layers of metallized thin plastic. And it's shown as gray in this drawing. Uh, it's as large as a tennis court. Uh, the project is a joint project of NASA with the European and Canadian space agencies. Uh, it was launched on December 21st of 2021. It took about 20,000 people to build it and launch it and get it going. Uh, and uh, it's available for use by all scientists around the world by sending us proposals. So the results will come out, and they are coming out uh, regularly. So I'll tell you a little bit more about the telescope as we go along. But before that, I want to give you a little bit of introduction about why we're doing it. Uh, what are the big questions that people want to know the answers to? So, for instance, where did we come from? What is the cosmic history of, of the universe? Uh, are we the only living sentient beings or not? And if they're not, then where are the neighbors? Uh, is life a miracle? Does it require a, a, an extremely unlikely uh, coincidence for it to occur? Or is this something that will always occur given, the chance, given an opportunity? Of course, we also want to know, can we travel out of the solar system? And I'm afraid my answer is, well, we can get it as far as Mars. We cannot personally escape from the solar system, but astronomers and you and I can travel as far as we like through imagination and pictures. So I'm going to take you with me as far as we can with the imagination and the pictures today. So uh, the beginning of science was over 2000 years ago, and I don't know all of the things that were done, but we have one small booklet called the Nature of Things, as translated from uh, from Latin uh, from about 2,000 years ago. Um, Lucretius knew, as many people did at that time, that uh, the universe could be made of atoms. Uh, they had a name, and, and it was and meant a small indivisible particle. Uh, they had evidence already, which could, for instance, include the fact that a glass of water can disappear uh, by evaporation. So one way that could be is if it's made of tiny invisible particles. So people understood a little bit, uh, and they did not yet know that there were the many kinds of particles that we have today, or that we would have nuclei and electrons and all the other parts. But they did recognize that structure could occur by combining the parts, and then uh, they would grow, and then they might disintegrate and disappear. And uh, that would be the end of those particular objects as the atoms would uh, separate into be forming something else. So uh, that was a long time ago. Um, now I want to tell you a little bit of my own, about my own story. This is the farm where I grew up in far northern New Jersey, not so far away from Carlisle. Um, and uh, this is a research farm belonging to Rutgers University. My father was there uh, studying cows. Uh, to see if we could get more and better milk from cows. And the answer is yes, we do have better now than we did then. Uh, for me, as a child growing up, it was a place to uh, look at the sky, to learn astronomy from books. Uh, the, the library sent their bookmobile around to the farm every two weeks, and I, bought, and I got all of the science books that I could get, and especially books about telescopes. So uh, that was a long time ago now. So a little bit of history. Uh, back in 1946, a few things happened. Uh, the World War II was finished, and uh, Lyman Spitzer, shown on the left here, uh, was working for uh, the Rand Corporation, which was a big think tank uh, involved in the defense effort. And when it was done, he wrote a memo saying, we should build telescopes in outer space. They would be good for looking down for, uh, for defense purposes, they would also be good for astronomy. We could look out. Later on, he wrote another version of the memo that said if you could build them big enough, you would be able to image planets orbiting other stars. So that's a good long time ago. 
and it wasn't exactly in 1946, but here is Sir Fred Hoyle, um, British cosmologist and brilliant thinker, who was the person who gave the name of the Big Bang to the expanding universe story that we have. And I think we have him to thank and to blame for the confusion that people now have about the expanding universe. Because when you give it that name, then people always will picture a small explosion in a pre-existing space. Uh, in other words, a firecracker. Uh, but of course, uh, what astronomers see is uh, an infinite universe, as far as we can tell, and it's just expanding in, in itself. So what we see is exactly the opposite of what people think of when they think of a Big Bang. Then in 1946, I also appeared. I am now 77. So um, people think that's an interesting picture. I actually don't remember. That was a long time ago. <laughs> so what else happened? Well, in... Uh, 1948, a couple of years later, uh, the two gentlemen on the left and right uh, were Robert Herman and Ralph Alpher, and they were calculating about the early universe. We already knew that there was a story of the expanding universe because we had seen um, measurements that showed that distant galaxies are running away from us extremely rapidly. They calculated that the heat radiation from the early universe should still exist and it should have a temperature of about five degrees above absolute zero, which isn't too far off considering that the real answer is 2.7. So that was 1948. Now, in 1948, it might have been possible to detect the radiation, but nobody tried. So uh, that went along, that didn't happen. Around 1954, I was a small child, and I went to the Museum of Natural History in New York City, and I saw the planetarium show and I learned that Mars might have canals. Uh, and it was very hopeful that year that we might see the canals. Now, uh, the canals, as you know, do not exist. But they, they were seen quite often by people. And so the current explanation is that those are images of the uh, blood vessels in the inside of an observer's eye. So we were fooled. Uh, it's kind of too bad uh, that we were fooled. But there is a reason behind it, which is that the, the Mars rotates uh, around its axis in just a little over one of our days. So the pattern would repeat almost every night that you went out to look. So they weren't quite careful enough to notice that problem. Uh, then in 1957, Sputnik went up. The Soviet Union launched a satellite, which completely terrified the Americans because it made it very obvious that we could be attacked. Uh, by nuclear weapons from outer space. And we were already quite concerned about the nuclear weapons. As a child, I was taught that in case of nuclear attack, we should hide under the desk. And it doesn't take an adult to figure out that that's not a good plan. <laughs> so uh, what happened then? Well, in 1958, the picture on the left is uh, the, uh, the copy of the front page of the charter for NASA to exist. Uh, Congress said there shall be NASA. And so we started NASA in 58. And uh, pretty quickly, of course, we said, we are going to the moon. So we're showing you President Kennedy. And I don't know if I'm set up so that you can hear the president when I play this. Yeah, you can probably. Let's try it. Do you hear him? Uh, you have to you have to share the sound, I think. Yes, uh, uh, I don't know how to do that. So So I'll just have to tell you what he said. So. President Kennedy announced that we would go to the moon uh, in within the decade and that we would do this and the other hard things and because it was hard and and he promised not only would do we go to the moon but we do all the other things that we thought were necessary to make a good world for us so the person on the right is James Webb the pre the administrator of NASA at the time 
and he he was the one who figured out how to do the mission and he almost got there he had to res resign before we were quite done because you might remember we uh, lost an, several astronauts three astronauts in a fire in the apollo capsule on the ground so uh, anyway he figured that out made sure we had a culture of doing things more reliably that we were sufficiently cautious and uh, to me it is a miracle that we were able to go and send our people to the moon in 1969 only 11 years after the formation of nasa so so what happened then well uh, now i want to come back to telling the story of astronomy um, astronomers look back in time by looking at things far away because we know the speed of light so we see things as they were when light was sent out um, to know how far you're looking you have to survey the universe we have two basic methods one is uh, trigonometry as we could have done thousands of years ago and people did know in many parts of the world how to do this uh, they, I know at least the Greek astronomers were able to measure the size of the Earth correctly uh, and even the distance to the moon, but they were unable to measure the distance to the sun at the time. The other method they would have understood quite well, which we would have said, um, if we can prove that those two candles that I've drawn here are identical, uh, but one looks fainter than the other, we would say it's fainter because it's farther away. So now we can survey the distances of all astronomical objects, at least in some way. So we also want to measure whether they're coming toward us or going away from us. Um, and nature has given us markers in the spectrum of light. Uh, if you spread out the light of, a, of the sun or an incandescent lamp, you get a nice little rainbow. If you pass the light through a hot gaseous material, um, then you may get an uh, particular wavelengths of light uh, and we see that when we uh, observe the fireworks on July the 4th here uh, particular elements show particular spectrum lines particular wavelengths and if we now look and observe a star like the sun or some other star we'll see similar marks so usually they're dark marks across the spectrum uh, due to the absorption of light by those kinds of molecules and uh, we see this similar pattern in distant stars as local except quite often the wavelengths are all shifted to longer wavelengths. And we say this is because the object is receding from us at some enormous speed. So now we can not only measure the distances of objects, but we can measure their speed toward us or away from us. And in 1929, uh, this graph was produced by Edwin Hubble, uh, the same Hubble that we named the telescope for. The graph shows the uh, estimated distances of galaxies on the horizontal axis and the velocity uh, going away from us on the vertical axis and you see there is a clear trend if you divide the distance by the speed you can calculate the age of the universe the first time we ever knew that there was even the possibility of having an age of the universe previously people would have guessed that it had no age at all that it was infinite so 1929, although it must be said that this was predicted uh, previously in 1927 by George Lemaitre, who was a Catholic priest from Belgium, uh, who also had a doctorate in mathematics from MIT. And so he did this by using Einstein's equations uh, to predict that this should be true. Okay, so uh, what do we do then? Well, um, skipping ahead, uh, I had a thesis project at the University of California at Berkeley to measure the cosmic background radiation that had been predicted uh, back in 1948. It had been discovered in 1965 in New Jersey at Bell Telephone Labs. And by 1974, I was a postdoc uh, in, uh, at NASA in uh, New York City. And there's the location uh, I used to bicycle to work. And I lived uh, on, in a little apartment uh, on the west side. And supercomputers in those days occupied entire floors of buildings, even though we would now be amazed at how little they could do. At any rate, um, it was there that we proposed a successor for the thesis project. Uh, here it is the cause of the Cosmic Background Explorer, as we imagine it to be in outer space. 
It had three instruments in it, one to measure the spectrum of the cosmic microwave radiation and compare it with the prediction of the expanding universe theory. Uh, it had a second set of instruments to measure the hot and cold spots in that radiation to see it's equally bright in all directions. It had a third instrument inside to um, look for infrared light that might have come from the distant universe, from things that we didn't know about and could never see with a telescope uh, because we would never have a big enough telescope to recognize them. But at any rate, that's the, in, tell us the COBE satellite as we imagine it to be in outer space. Um, and here is the key thing that uh, drew a special worldwide attention. Uh, uh, two years after the launch, we were able to publish this map. Um, this is a map of the hot and cold spots in the radiation of the Big Bang, as observed uh, at wavelengths of a few millimeters. Uh, and the hot and cold spots are very, very faint. The temperature of the whole map is about 2.7 Kelvin. And the hot and cold spots, there are about one part in 100,000 of that. So about 30 micro Kelvin variations of temperature from place to place. When Stephen Hawking saw the picture, he said, it was the most important scientific discovery of the century, if not of all time. Now, why would Stephen Hawking say that? Well, number one, um, we believe that the spots represent uh, density variations of the early universe and that uh, the denser regions uh, have enough gravity to stop the expansion of the material and pull it back to form galaxies and then stars, black holes, planets, and finally people. So we are here because of those spots plus the action of gravity. Uh, scientifically, we're also... A, uh, very interested because the spots appear to sp spots come mostly from dark matter and their uh, distribution is affected also by the dark energy that uh, we now have deduced but can never see. Uh, and the third reason is uh, if we ever understand the cause of these spots, perhaps we'll begin to understand quantum gravity, which is one of the great mysteries of physics, uh, at least for the max, well, Einstein worked on it, he failed. Many other per people have worked on it. And so far, it's still a big mystery. So now what are we going to do now? Well, of course, I show my graph. I went to the Stockholm. I received my diploma from the King of Sweden and uh, I've been celebrating and going on to the next project. The next project um, is, um, well, of course, the Hubble telescope was launched uh, soon after the COBE satellite. It's now 33 years old and still working beautifully, uh, taking pictures every day, uh, thanks to the fact that we sent up astronauts already five times to improve it, fix it, repair its focus, and make sure it's ready to continue on into the distant future. As far as we know, it could last a long time before uh, atmospheric friction makes the orbit decay and bring it back, back down to Earth. So uh, there is a hugely difficult and successful space engineering project there with a huge results on astronomy. Virtually every textbook on astronomy had to be rewritten after this Hubble telescope was, was launched and repaired. But in uh, 1995, a committee was formed to write a book about what should we do next after the Hubble telescope. And they wrote a book that said, please build us a new telescope that's bigger and more powerful and capable of observing infrared light. So I will show you what is special about infrared. Uh, and many of you already know because of your work. But anyway, I'll just summarize why it's important for astronomers. Um, project is uh, NASA led uh, by an organization here at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. Uh, as an international collaboration with Europe and Canada. We have a very large aerospace contractor that works with us, that's Northrop Grumman Space Systems. When we chose them, they were still called TRW, uh, but then they were acquired by Northrop Grumman. Uh, we have four uh, instruments on board, near-infrared camera that comes from the University of Arizona, makes a lot of very beautiful pictures that you've seen. We have a spectrograph, it's produced in Europe by the European Space Agency with their contractors. 
We have a mid-infrared instrument that takes pictures and makes spectra. Uh, and an international partnership made that, including the Jet Propulsion Lab and Europe. And finally, there's a fine guidance sensor and a, another spectrograph. It's produced by the Canadian Space Agency. So the very powerful international partnership to bring all these instruments together. Telescope is operated by the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland, which is the same place that runs the Hubble Space Telescope and processes the data, makes them all available to the public, such as you. So to, uh, which we've already said here that the telescope is six and a half meters in diameter. I didn't tell you yet that the telescope is cold. It's cooled down to about 40 or 45 Kelvin. So that it does not emit very much infrared light. And so that the detectors will be able to detect the infrared. It was launched on the European Ariane 5 rocket on Christmas morning, uh, uh, December 25 of 2021. And we planned to have a five-year science mission, and we would be very happy if we got 10 years. Now it looks like we can get 20 or more years beyond today, which will make us extremely proud, and uh, astronomers will be very happy to get all the data. Here it is uh, being launched on December 25th. Uh, it was actually well after sunrise, but the camera has been adjusted to expose for the brilliant light of the rocket engines themselves. So you would think it was dark, but it was uh, daytime and we had a perfect launch. And that's the reason why we have such a long predicted lifetime uh, because we use fuel uh, for various reasons. And when the fuel is done, then the mission is over. This is where we sent the observatory, where it still is. Uh, there's a place in space called the Lagrange Point 2. Actually, there are five Lagrange points in this Sun-Earth system. Um, and these are places where an object can stay uh, forever um, uh, by balancing the gravitational forces of the Sun and the Earth. So this particular one is not quite stable. Uh, it is 1.5 million kilometers farther from the Earth than the sun. Excuse me, it is 1.5 million kilometers uh, from the Earth in the opposite direction from the sun, as shown here in the, in the sketch. We actually do not go right to the Lagrange point because it's in the shadow of the Earth, and we actually need the solar power to run the observatory. But it's a perfect place to put the telescope because it's relatively near to Earth, so it's easy to co communicate with it. And uh, the single-sided umbrella, the sunshade, can protect the telescope from the heat of the sun, the Earth, and the moon very easily. So the telescope is cooled down to its low temperature uh, passively just by radiating heat to outer space. So now I want to talk about why we built a telescope to observe infrared light. Uh, there are numerous reasons. Uh, this is one of them. Uh, this is a picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope at visible wavelengths, uh, wavelengths you and I can see. Uh, and what we are looking at is a new star being born inside this amazing, beautiful cloud of gas and dust. And you can't really see it very well, but right here in the front, is the star uh, sending out luminous jets of material uh, as it's being born. Uh, and with Hubble, we were able to do some infrared capability. So now we see the same location um, with Hubble, and we see that the dust cloud has become almost transparent. You can see through the dust, see the stars behind the dust, see the details of the star being born inside the cloud. So we knew immediately that uh, an infrared camera would be able to see stars being born inside their dust. Uh, this is one of the great mysteries of astronomy. We, obviously, there are stars everywhere, uh, but we've never been able to see them directly in the process of being born. So that's number one. Uh, number two, of course, uh, many objects are not warm enough to emit visible light. Uh, so... Uh, but they're plenty warm enough to emit infrared. Uh, as an example, you and I are each emitting approximately 500 watts of infrared power, and uh, uh, we would be visible from a great distance using an infrared telescope. 
this particular object is called the Southern Ring Planetary Nebula. Uh, and it's seen uh, with our images are taken with infrared uh, equipment on the Webb telescope. The relatively short wavelengths on the left and the longer wavelengths on the right. Uh, and so we're now able to see things that are not visible at all with the Hubble. In fact, um, combining two things, we're able to see right in the center of the right-hand side that uh, the star that we thought was a single star disintegrating is actually at least two. The current opinion is there are five stars there in the core of this nebula. Uh, and what we're seeing uh, is, is debris that is being expelled from the atmosphere of one of the stars as it's getting old. <clears throat> Um, this is actually a very common thing. Almost all stars end their lives by sending out some of their material into outer space, and they look sort of like this. Um, it's called a planetary nebula, although it only looks like a planet. It is certainly not one. So here's a magnified image of this, as seen by the Webb telescope. So the third... oh. Um, just to, as an example of a, something beautiful we've seen with this technology, here are two stars orbiting around each other. And every time they get close together, uh, one of the stars sends out a puff of its atmosphere uh, into space. And we see this strange, not quite circular set of shells being produced by this interaction, uh, as seen on the left. <clears throat> by the way, the... Uh, Data have been reprocessed on the left by a, an amateur a image processing specialist, Judy Schmidt. She lives in California, and she receives NASA data and makes them look better. So you can see what they're trying to tell us. So the third reason that to study infrared light is that the universe is expanding. Now we see distant galaxies running away from us at enormous speeds, giving what we call the Doppler shift. Another way of describing this is that space itself is expanding. But now since space is not a thing or a substance, made, it's not made of atoms, for instance, it's a, a little tricky, but it's an interesting way to think about the expanding universe, that space itself could be expanding. So um, because distant objects are going away from us at great speeds, we need an infrared telescope to pick up light that started off at visible or ultraviolet wavelengths. So that's the, what the picture is trying to tell us here. Build an infrared telescope to do ultraviolet astronomy in the early universe. So now I want to show you some of the data we got. Uh, a year ago, on July 11th, uh, President Biden released this image uh, to the public. And it's beautiful for astronomers as well as for uh, the public. Uh, it shows a number of things I'll describe for you. Uh, the, the stars in here, like this one, with the blue spikes sticking out, those are ordinary stars here nearby. And because we already know about most of them, uh, it's not a big surprise that they're there. Um, we see also these huge fuzzy objects right in the middle. Let's see if I can get my uh, pointer to work so you can see it. So. Here we have a great galaxy in the middle, very bright. And um, it's important to us, not because it's there, but because it has so much gravity. Uh, and it and its neighboring fuzzy galaxies, they all have so much gravity that they bend the space. Einstein told us in 1916 that gravity operates by bending space-time. And he soon realized that the bending space-time would mean that a, a gravitational lens could exist. The galaxies in the foreground, the big bright ones, are, can magnify and distort the images of the more distant ones. So here we see several arcs of strange-looking galaxies. In this case, uh, these two arcs are, the, are duplicate images of a more distant object. Sometimes we see three or four or five images of the same distant object because this lens is not one that we would design to be a, making a perfect image. It has multiple but imperfect images of the same thing. So 
Uh, just to give you a sense of how much is light bent, you can see that light is, can be bent by several arc minutes just by the presence of a galaxy. And the typical light wave from the early universe has already been bent by one or two arc minutes by the time it gets to our equipment. So this is a laboratory for us to study the most distant galaxies we can find with the greatest possible magnification. So after we've found the most interesting ones, we do additional steps. Uh, we magnify the image. First, we find the ones that seem strange and different. We magnify the image as much as we can, and we also obtain a spectrum of each one. Spread out the light into its colors to learn about its chemistry, its temperature, and the motions within it from the Doppler effects. So we're illustrating here that we are surprised by what we're finding. The early galaxies that we found are much too big, much too bright, seem to be too massive. Uh, they already have structure. Some of them already have spiral shapes fairly early on. So this was not predicted by astronomers. Uh, we're not yet ready to tell you why we were wrong. Right now, we just know that we were wrong. So this is a big puzzle coming. Here's an example of, uh, of a highly magnified image. Uh, one of those little streaks uh, has been so highly magnified that we can recognize individual star clusters. So each one of these little objects with a circle around it comprises maybe 100,000 fairly ordinary stars. And we see a couple of dozen of them in this particular early galaxy. So um, we astronomers are thrilled to see this and we've dealt, called this one the sparkler because it has so many little objects in it. Here's an image of something we call Stefan's Quintet. There are five galaxies in the picture. Uh, Mr. Stefan uh, noticed this combination a long time ago. Now we know that the one on the left is all by itself, and the other four are all close to each other. And the two right here in the middle are right in the process of combining. And uh, they will, within a few hundred million years, uh, be completely mixed together, and they will no longer be spirals. Um, you see these uh, luminous re regions around them. Uh, these are new generations of stars that have been formed because of the collision. The one on the top actually has a black hole right in the middle. Uh, and how do we know there's a black hole? Uh, we see an extremely point-like object with very bright. And we say, how can anything that small be so bright? Uh, so then we calculate the motions of things around it. And we say, now we know the mass as well. So there's a black hole in there, and we see it because things are falling into it. Here's another beautiful picture showing what we call the cartwheel galaxy. This is now interpreted as a collision. The small galaxy in the upper left. Um, see if I can use this. The small galaxy in the upper left. Um, it, went right straight through the middle of this big galaxy down here. And um, the, what we're seeing is the result of the collision. Material was splashed out and the new stars were born in the ring around it. So right now it's a laboratory for us. We're able to calculate and simulate the formation of the new stars and the motions of the gas from this uh, collision. Here is another galaxy that we uh, uh, point out uh, seems to have holes in it. Um, this is an ordinary galaxy. We just thought it was an ordinary spiral galaxy before. Uh, now when we take an infrared picture, we see that uh, there are holes and there it looks like a uh, um, like a, um, a slice through a sponge. So what would make holes in a galaxy? Uh, we think that it's because there are stars uh, that are formed in these middles of these holes. And they, when they are formed, they produce so much energy that they push the remaining material away from them. So galaxy with holes, we never would have known this without the Webb telescope. We are looking at something people call the pillars of creation. 
Uh, this is a place where stars are being born as we speak. Uh, what we see appears to have a wind flow, flowing from the right top or right corner down towards the lower left. And the wind is coming because of new stars that have been born. It's like that little hole in the galaxy that I just showed you. But this is close up, so we can see individual stars inside this cloud being born today. Uh, one of my favorite pictures is this one. Uh, this is a star uh, in the process of being formed. What we're seeing right here in the middle, it looks like a hamburger bun. The dark area across the center is uh, where the new stars are being born. Excuse me, where the new star is being born with uh, dust grains orbiting around it, like a new solar system with the ecliptic plane filled with dust and planets growing in it. Light is shining up and down, uh, illuminating the remainder of the cloud, and there's a jet of material coming out the north and south poles of the new star. So we see that, and now we'd like to know exactly what's going on inside. Astronomers now have something to work on to calculate all of this. So we are also looking at planets around other stars. Um, Planets sometimes go in front of their host stars, as the little movie in the upper right corner shows you. Uh, when a planet goes in front of the star, you can say, I know it's there. If it comes back every seven days or so, you know it takes a week to go around and you can calculate its orbit. You can calculate its temperature because of the properties of the star and the geometry. So now we have calculations of the size and temperature of an object. And now we want to know does it have an atmosphere? So if it does, some of the starlight goes through the atmosphere of the planet on its way to our telescope. And that makes it seem like it's a different size at each different wavelength. For instance, clouds in the upper atmosphere would make the planet look bigger. Or uh, molecules at certain wavelengths would make the planet look bigger at those wavelengths than at others. So we've been looking, uh, we have at least five dozen planets we've already looked at. Um, and so far, all of the small ones, the size of Earth or a little bigger, uh, seem to have no atmosphere. Uh, larger planets usually do have atmosphere. And in fact, most of them, um, like Neptune or Jupiter, are so large that they are have all atmosphere and maybe have no solid core. It's hard to tell. So at any rate, we are now using a technique that we can find out what is the chemistry of the atmosphere of a planet around another star. Uh, so far, we have many molecules. We have carbon dioxide, we have methane, we have ammonia, and we have water in some planets, just not in the atmospheres of any small Earth-like planets. Here's an example of one that shows not only the molecules I mentioned, but even sodium and potassium can be seen in absorption uh, using all four uh, or all using three of the four web telescope instruments to get spectra and and so we're very proud of ourselves that we're getting about the same answer with each different kind of equipment we have been of course looking in our own solar system here is good old jupiter uh, and we're showing you that it has several satellites of its own uh, that it has a ring, which you can sort of see here. Uh, it has an aurora at the north and south poles. Uh, it even has uh, the effect of the satellite Io or Eo, um, because uh, Eo is very close to Jupiter and is uh, very hot and is sending out sulfur vapor uh, that uh, interacts with the, the ionosphere of, of Jupiter. Uh, we, as you know, attacked an asteroid. We dropped a large piece of metal onto this one. Uh, we watched it with the Hubble telescope and with the Webb telescope. And we learned that um, some debris would come out. And uh, we also learned that we were able to move the, the asteroid about five times as much as we would have moved it if it were only a billiard ball collision. So this is helpful in our plans to protect the Earth from asteroids. We've been looking at Titan. Titan is a satellite of Saturn. And satellite of Saturn, that's very interesting because it has weather. 
It has uh, a very low temperature. It's a, about 60 or so degrees Kelvin. Uh, and but So the weather there is made of hydrocarbons, uh, ethane and methane. Um, we have lakes, rivers, clouds, rain, all made of ethane and methane. And so uh, we are sending a small helicopter called the Dragonfly to land on Titan in another decade or so. Uh, so right now we're just trying to learn about it, about as much as we can about Titan and its chemistry and surface before we go. Uh, just a couple more beautiful pictures. Here is Neptune seen with its uh, very bright satellite in the, upper, uh, in the upper edge of the picture and many others uh, with the ancient uh, mythological names attached. And here is uh, Uranus, a similar picture. Uranus is special for us because it's the only planet in the solar system where the spin axis is in approximately the orbit plane. So that means that sometimes we can see the north or south pole of Uranus directly. In this case, the satellites are labeled with uh, names of Shakespearean characters. So there's a lot more to say. Um, you can follow along with, uh, with the web telescope data on our own websites, but because we are so popular, there's a news event every day uh, from all of our media. And so uh, I hope that you're finding excitement these days in the news media, as well as looking at our direct websites. And if you want to propose to observe with the web telescope, you have to send us a proposal, but everyone is uh, eligible to propose. So maybe I'll stop here. Uh, there are many more questions we could address, uh, but it's a good time for questions. So uh, let me uh, ask four questions. And Anis, uh, would you like to run that process? Yes, uh, sure, sure. Well, first of all, um, thank you so much. Um, um, we we can never learn enough. So at least we have, as a layman, uh, uh, we have the um, our background. Um, uh, so uh, let us open the floor for uh, questions. Uh, and uh, please ask one at a time. And uh, I think for the process, let me ask uh, one uh, by one uh, if you have a question. So maybe we should uh, start uh, with uh, Dr. Khalid uh, from Toronto. Uh, he's a medical doctor, but he's very curious about all of these things. Dr. Khalid, do you have any question or comment? Please be brief. Unmute yourself. Yes. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, I do, Khalid. Sorry, Dr. Nasser. Um, no, my question is basically um, the JSWT can block out most of the infrared red, uh, rays. Why can't the Hubble do the same? Why did you have to make the web when we could have put that little extra app in in uh, Hubble? Ah. Why do we not have it in the Hubble? Okay. The, well, the mo most important thing the Hubble doesn't have is cold. Um, so the Hubble is warm enough that it emits a vast amount of infrared light itself, just as you and I do. So uh, you can't build a telescope um, that works well when it's emitting its own signal. So the Webb telescope is cold. It operates about 40 or 50 Kelvin in different places, uh, except for one of the detectors, which runs at about 7 Kelvin. So... Um, that's why the Hubble could not possibly do this work. And similarly, why you cannot do it from Earth. Because, of course, here on Earth, everything is warm and it's glowing with infrared light. Uh, I have one more question. Please. Okay. Um, where you showed the L12345, the different positions of Lamert, uh, you said something very significant. That at certain positions, uh, the, the web tel uh, uh, telescope cannot visualize because of the uh, shadow of the earth falling on the, the, it. Now, if that is so, that means the telescope is not working 24-7 for us, is it? Ah, well, actually, no, we have chosen an orbit where it orbits around the shadow spot. So uh, it's never in the shade. 
Uh, so it always is working. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, we have Dr. Uh, Shafiqul Islam Umuya joining from Dhaka. He was uh, the, he just retired as the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission of Bangladesh. So, oh my goodness, yes. So yeah, please Dr. go ahead. Yeah. yeah, Shafiq, if you have any question or comment, please go ahead, unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for the fascinating pictures that we have seen. Actually, well, we don't understand much of it. It's just like a, what we say in Bengali, Rupkatha, what is, what is the English word of this? So, well, and that's, uh, it fascinates me this when I read all these stories that going back <laughs> towards the uh, uh, what we say that we are going back to time. It's like a time machine. And I just wonder, someday, do you think, it may, be, it, it, you, it may be a stupid question, do you think that someday it might be possible to see the great explosion that is what happened in 10 to the power minus 43 seconds after the Big Bang? Oh Explosion. my goodness! Yeah. So the closest we can get is the image that I showed you with a pink and blue spots. Uh, that is the image of the universe when it was four hundred thousand years old. Um, so uh, the universe, early universe, is opaque. So light does not uh, travel in a straight line. So it cannot travel at all until um, the universe becomes transparent at the age of four hundred thousand years. So that's the best we can do. Uh, the rest we have to calculate and imagine. Oh, I just wonder if the technology will evolve someday that we'll see. That um, data. We can hope, but uh, uh, there is actually nothing we have in mind that we could possibly do. Is this uh, the red shift or other other physics in it? Yeah. So the picture I showed you with the pink and blue bobs is from a red shift of about a thousand. But that's uh, not nearly far enough to go all the way back to the very first moments. Wonderful. Yeah, any, any more questions? We... No, this is okay. It's just like a beautiful um, look at the beginning. Wonderful. But anyway, it's the reality. We can, we can, we can um, imagine the vastness of the universe. And we understand that still, we know very little of it, very little. And about this, uh, uh, if you would just say something about this uh, black energy and the expanding universe. So the black uh, energy, is this uh, the fourth or fifth energy that uh, you know that is expanding the universe? What is the energy behind this? Expanding uh, universe. Yes, so actually no one really knows. Uh, what we have is observations that we say, yes, the universe is expanding. Uh, we have observations that say it has dark matter in it, transparent matter, which has gravity but does not do anything else. Uh, it has the dark energy, which causes the acceleration in recent times. Um, and these are all done by calculation. Uh, we cannot actually see them because they're not luminous. Uh, so um, all we can do is report that we have deduced that they must be there. So we can we can never reach the expanding expansion because it's accelerating more than light. So the speed of light. So we will never get this. But yeah. uh, uh, I was, well, you, you told me just right now, you were telling me that the, uh, the dark energy may be responsible for the expansion. Is there any scientific uh, proof that the dark energy is responsible for the expansion? Yeah, uh, we have uh, quite a lot of proof, and there was enough that a Nobel Prize was given for discovering and measuring the dark energy. 
um, and it's been confirmed in about five different ways. So we're pretty sure it's there, but we don't know what it is. All we have observed really is the acceleration. So uh, Einstein had a place for it in his calculations. And so as far as we know, what we see fits perfectly with his calculations, but uh, nobody knows why it's there. Okay, so let's let's move on. I think Kazibai has a question. Please, please unmute yourself. Yeah, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask a question. Thank you. This is a fascinating talk. Uh, I didn't understand. Uh, I think fifty percent of it, but uh, uh, I have got one question about the existence of life elsewhere in the universe. Uh, I know that we have discovered a lot of planets this way, uh, but based upon the, the finding that how many you have, how much space you have observed and how many planets you have found, what is the prediction that there is how what what fraction what, what fraction of the planets actually might have some of these things in the universe so the life could actually exist like us yes um we have found that uh, most stars have planets most stars have several planets um and uh, most and about 20% of all stars have a planet about the right size and temperature to be like Earth. We have no information yet about whether any of them have the right chemistry. So, uh, but we have, of course, the one observation that Earth is alive. So, uh, and we also have one observation that says it did not require very long for Earth to become alive after there were oceans. So we had um, no oceans that we know of from geology for about mm, half a billion or a billion years uh, in the Earth's history. And then within a few hundred million years of the first oceans, we have fossil evidence of life. So that says that perhaps life is common because it happens quickly. In that case, um, then it just is a question of where are... Uh, what places are compatible with life? What places could have life? So my my guess is a purely a guess because we have no measurements is that uh, there will be um, life in every planetary system um, because there will be somewhere wet in every planetary system. Maybe it will be under an ocean. Maybe it will be in the rocks underneath the surface. Um, and maybe the life would be impossible to find from here. Uh, but I think there will be life in every planetary system. That's my guess. And another uh, related question that uh, uh, our life is carbon-based, but is it necessary condition to have life? Ah, we do not know what is necessary. Um, so it's purely a guess. Uh, my, my guess is that if there's an ocean, there is life. If there's water, there is life and liquid water. And how would you know? Well, we have uh, the possibility of discovering oxygen in the atmosphere of another planet in another solar system. We would say, ah, oh, possibly photosynthesis. We have the possibility of uh, visiting uh, other places in our own solar system, Mars and Europa and Titan and Enceladus there are possibilities of liquid water there. And if we could find some samples and get some information about those, then maybe we will know that there's life elsewhere here in the solar system. So those are the two big possibilities for us. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, let's move on to Dr. Sufyan Khandakar. Uh, Sufyan, if you have any questions and comments. Thank you, Alice. Uh... It's a very fascinating presentation by 
Dr. Mathur is beyond me. I'm, I'm a simple engineer, deal with water, water resources, floods and things like that. For me to go to the sky is kind of uh, very fascinating. But the picture and the story, the way you have told it, very simple way, it really uh, created uh, lots of interest in the presentation. The few of the question, of course, the outstanding question everybody asks is the existence of life in another planet. Again, the answer is, as you gave, is probably the correct answer. I'm going to switch a little bit uh, that uh, there are lots of uh, talk in these days regarding the UFO or EFE, whatever it is, and particularly recently, Mexico was showing some pictures and claiming that these are from the outer space. Can you make some observation to those? Okay, well, I, good question. I have no specific information about those reports, um, but um, Enrico Fermi, famous physicist, asked uh, if long distance space travel is possible, where is everyone? So uh, why, why, where are those visitors? So there are two possible answers. Well, one is uh, long distance space travel is not possible. Uh, one is that uh, those kinds of civilizations that could do it um, are too far away. Yeah, so I think on my, my guess is that long distance uh, space travel is impossible for biological grief beings like ourselves uh, at the speed that we could go it would take a hundred thousand years to get to alpha centauri where there probably are planets so in a hundred thousand years we would be dead we cannot survive that trip so uh, even robots that we could build would be tired after a hundred thousand years of travel so um I don't know what we've seen locally. I don't know about the reports from Mexico, but I do think it's unlikely that uh, they're coming from space aliens. Okay, uh, let's uh, let's go to uh, Dr. Shabi Purvis. He is uh, familiar with satellites. He has a company who does with uh, satellite. Uh, and probably a little bit of imagery. Uh, Shabibha, you have any question or comment? Uh, he's probably muted. I don't know if he's listening. So okay. uh, he's probably not, not listening. Anyway, so then we also have Mr. Montazir Rahman. He works for Riva. Riva is a well-known company makes the imaging and spectrometer. Um, and if you have any question, Montezibai, uh, please unmute yourself and ask. Thank you. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to ask a question to uh, Dr. Mather. Well, um, my world is completely different from what I heard from today's presentation. I am involved in chemical sensing of especially the gases, compounds. So it's a light absorption spectroscopy. Um, most of the time, I use some different wavelength of lights and uh, a detector, normally the MCD detector. Sometimes it, it's remote sensing. So I was wondering how can I actually relate, correlate my work with Dr. Mather's work to find out compounds in the space? Uh, well, good question. Um, number one, I would confirm that we use the same kind of detectors, more or less mercury, cadmium, telluride detectors are excellent detectors for astronomy. And so we have spectroscopy on board the telescope um, with a spectral resolution of about uh, 3000. 
which is enough to distinguish one molecule from another if the, uh, the spectrum information is there. So we've detected quite a large number of different molecules in space, uh, either because they appear to emit extra light or because they absorb light at particular wavelengths. So uh, we use the same or similar technique to what you do um, to see um, molecules in a gas. So it's pretty similar, I think. So thank you. So yeah, in my so, case, so so for just a curiosity that uh, is it only the gas that you are interested in, or uh, studying the space rocks and meteors and stuff like that? Could that give any similar information by any chance? Yes, uh, we do study the solid phase. Also, uh, dust particles uh, can be seen. And we already know that some of them have uh, spectral features from ice of various kinds. Uh, water ice, um, ammonia ice, carbon dioxide ice, uh, all have uh, different spectra. And we can recognize those in some objects, uh, particularly in uh, places where stars are being born, in the outflows from new or old stars, and in comets where uh, those molecules will be coming out uh, along with dust grains as the comets are uh, disintegrated in, in the solar system. So uh, we indeed do look for solid phase uh, as well as gas phase features in the spectra. All right. Um, uh, uh, now um, we also have Professor Afzal from Truman University. Uh, uh, Professor Afzal, if you have any question or comment. Well, I used to actually uh, teach a course called The Origins of Life uh, uh, as an interdisciplinary course where we used to look into all sorts of possibilities. But again, the whole thing comes from the fact is if the chemical conditions are ideal, uh, life would happen. But we haven't come across any real examples yet. So that's always an interesting case. Uh, what would, what would, what would uh, we find? Okay, I, I don't know if there was a question or just a, just a comment. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, what might be, I mean, uh, is, the, is the oxygen or the carbon would be the signature for life? Um, nothing as simple as a signature. Uh, okay. a, oxygen is a, is a clue. Yes. Um, because here on Earth, it's very reactive. Yes, And um, it would only exist for a short time unless it was continually being produced by plants and algae. So, um, but if you see a lot of oxygen in another planet, it's still not quite enough. You have to consider the possibilities of other sources of oxygen. So we shall see. Um, and, and the liquid is also a requirement because the chemical reactions that are required for life cannot happen in solid phase probably. I think that's true, but uh, um, that's I'm not a chemist, I'm not a biologist, so I th I'm just uh, sure. guessing about that. Hmm. Wonderful. Uh, I, I have one quick question, and that's about the imaging, the IR, the infrared made the magic compared to the Hubble's visible uh, spectrum detectors. That's because IR uh, detectors are slightly different. They work in bigger wavelength. Uh, and of course, we know the diffraction limit is, is still uh, applies to to any wavelength. Now, uh, so if, if uh, for the moment, if we think that diffraction limit somehow magically or whatever could be overcome, then opening up even bigger wavelength uh, would that have any benefit for uh, space imaging? Ah, well, my goodness, there certainly are ideas for improving angular resolution. Uh, the traditional one is to build an interferometer, uh, which is a, an optical instrument that's um, like a telescope, but without the, uh, the whole mirror. So just pieces of the mirror uh, collect some of the information, and then we can use some of the information to get the, the image that we want. So it's not quite as good, but it's a uh, very powerful, and we do use them. Uh, so uh, when, for instance, you saw the images of the black hole 
that were made a couple of years ago that was done with interferometer techniques where we have a few antennas, uh, about 10 of them, in different places on Earth. And they recorded the waveforms on hard drives and they brought them together to a computer and they correlated them to make an image. So it's a huge accomplishment. And yes, it's possible to do it that way. Um, there are some very imaginative proposals regarding quantum storage of light. And uh, I think that's too difficult for me to anticipate what will happen. Um, it's not logically impossible, but I don't see how it could happen. Well, uh, is uh, any, anyone else have any other question or comments? Uh, yeah, I, I had a quick question. Yeah, please. <clears throat> Again, uh, through this discussion and uh, some others also, we are uh, now we understand that the extended universe, you know, the universe is extending. Now the question is that relatively, suppose our solar system, we have a distance from the sun to the earth as of today. Is that distance is being expanded also? If that is true, what are the consequences? Because at this distance, we get certain amount of energy, heat, all those kinds of things. If that varies, then what are the consequences of that variation? Or the what is the end result of this expansion, continuous expansion to uh, universe or the planet system? Excellent question. In fact, uh... We have been working on that for a long time. Uh, so we have a measurement, of course, of the distance to the moon. Uh, we do that with laser pulses that we send out uh, from observatory on the surface of the Earth. And we can measure the position of the moon uh, within a precision of a millimeter uh, by the laser, laser pulses. Uh, Apollo astronauts left uh, some reflectors on the surface of the moon just for this purpose. And the answer seems to be, no, there is no effect of the cosmic expansion on the orbit of the moon. So big question has been measure, answered by measurement. Okay, any other, yeah, go ahead. So I said that the relative distance between the planet or the sun and the earth is still, is not varying much. That's, is that the reason yes, that that's we, correct. we don't expect much changes because of that. That's correct. Uh, they're all very tightly bound together by gravity. Um, ordinary gravity, according to Isaac Newton's form, is sufficient to describe what we see in the solar system with very small corrections for relativity. So as far as we are aware, the cosmic expansion does not affect the orbits of planets in the solar system that, in a way that we could measure. Thank you. All right, so we are coming close to our uh, allocated time until 3 p.m., but uh, we still have a few more minutes. Um, uh, and uh, if anyone else has any more question or comments, please feel free to uh, ask. Uh, otherwise, uh, we, we may come to close. Uh, and, and, uh, and If I may, please. Yeah, yeah, my please, go ahead. Is, my name is Mohammed Abdul Rakim from Essex in England. And I'm very happy that I'm participating with you guys. I'm not a physicist now, rather I'm a chartered accountant return. But I have a question for Dr. Mathen, the Nobel laureate. Uh, it's the light, light and the wave particle duality. I still cannot understand it. How light, which is a wave, and which is a corpuscle or particle, when you are looking at it, it behaves one way. When you are not looking at it, it behaves another way. I know it's a very basic question, but it puzzles me, like this fine structure constant that used to wake people up. People like Dirac, people like Feynman. Uh, I was very fortunate to be at Cambridge. Cavendish Laboratory, where uh, probably the last Nobel laureate was Professor Mott. Uh, and 
and, and then recently probably Roger Penrose has some connection with Cambridge and he's Oxford based. So really with that in mind, is there a good reason why uh, quantum mechanics and relativity and, and this wave particle duality, uh, so basic, should behave like this? In my youth, probably I should say in my, uh, when I was a child, in a village, remote village in Bangladesh, I used to walk and I used to see some sort of leaves. I don't know what you call them, but as soon as you touch them, they would close. So that means when you are seeing at them, they behave one way. When you are away from them, they are completely free. Is there a correlation of some sort between uh, the wave and particle aspect of light? Thank you very much. Oh, my goodness. You're asking one of the hardest questions of physics. Uh, we have observed uh, uh, that uh, light can behave as a wave, and we have observed that it can behave as a particle. And we have all the equations necessary to calculate everything about it. Yeah. Um, but it's uh, still very puzzling to all of us because uh, we are so used to thinking of particles as the explanation for everything. Uh, a particle occupying a place in space and having a particular velocity. And nevertheless, we know that's not good enough. So um, people are making some progress on trying to see why a wave description of things still acts like it has particles in it. Right. Uh, always. So um, I think ask again uh, to people in the future, they will have a better explanation for it. Right now we are just... I think almost everyone is puzzled about how is it possible that we have both wave and particle behavior of the same thing. And um, the wave nature tells you that something is not localized. Uh, yes. You cannot say it's, uh, a wave is here. The, a wave only exists in space. So here's a related question. Uh, if you're a mathematician, you probably studied analytic functions and complex variables. Yes, and, I did. Yeah, Once so upon a time. A, there's a puzzle in that one, too. A, 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 an analytic function is entirely determined by its uh, behavior on a short, finite interval of, of its uh, input value. So that, so the, the analytic nature of the, of the complex variable is quite surprising to all of us. So even ordinary mathematics has big surprises in it before we even get to physics. I see. Yeah. Well, we, we, got, <clears throat> we got Sarah Tosnimbavi uh, come back. Uh, she is a, she's the chairman of the Department of Computer Science in, in Connecticut. Ah. Uh, so I don't know if she's, Sarah, <clears throat> uh, Leo has any question. Or comment, please. I don't have any question. I am not up to that level of asking any question to Dr. Mather. I just wanted to express my gratitude to deliver such a wonderful talk to Bangladeshi American community. Well, thank you, Dr. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. yeah, I'm happy to be able to do it with you. <laughs> yeah, it's a great, great, what do I say? I'm humbled to speak to you. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, and uh, I teach at a university at, uh, in Connecticut, Eastern Connecticut State University. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a teaching university, and I teach computer science originally from Bangladesh. And just wanted to mention very recently, me and my colleague received a NASA Connecticut Space Ga Grant. Oh, that's excellent that news. Congratulations. Two students, yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you so much. We have involved two students and we are doing artificial intelligence like convolutional neural network image classification. Oh, wow. Yeah, right, right. We are all working on that. I'm sure you know about AlexNet and ResNet. Those classification uh, networks are classifying images. 
Earth images, Mars images. So we are trying with our undergrad students. <laughs> yes. So, by the way, there's an astronomer I know uh, mm -hmm. uh, from Bangladesh. Do you know uh, Saku Vertalek? She's at the Center for Astrophysics in uh, Harvard. Oh, yeah. W what's the name once again, please? Saku, S-A-K-U. Vertilek, mm -hmm. she's married a guy named Vertilek, V-R-T-I-L-E-K. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we. Mm -hmm. I think I we heard the name. I haven't met yes. him yet, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. we'll, we'll mm -hmm. find out more about it. And and e echoing Professor uh, Tasneem, uh, we we really uh, would like to express our gratitude to Dr. Mather uh, mm -hmm. for for his. Uh, the you know kind of appearance here the time he took and uh and the, all the thing that we are learning from him he took the time to educate us is really an honor and fortune for for all of us um i hope uh, dr mather will come back to us again and and educate us some more on his uh ever never-ending journey of of space exploration Mm -hmm. And uh, you know this. This is, the, is so fascinating and so exhilarating for our community that um, <clears throat> you know people who came from Bangladesh. I I came some forty some years ago, <laughs> and yeah. ever since started learning whatever little I can. But yet um, we have not been able to make any significant contribution. So this kind of inspiration um, for our community is very important that someday maybe some Bangladeshi American will <laughs> make some contribution in, in science and, and technology. So, well, probably many of them have, you just don't know who they are yet. So I put the uh, uh, a website for Saku Vertilek uh, in the chat. Oh, okay. thank you, you very it, much. You can read about, about her. Sure, that, that would be wonderful. She's my friend also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so any, any last comment from anyone else? Um, we, we came to the end of our allocated time. I have a quick question. Um, yeah, yeah, please. The number of uh, Goldilocks planets or the habitable zone planets that our knowledge today is much more than only a few years ago. And more and more planets are getting into that list. So what's our resolution? How far can we uh, look into the stars to look at for these kind of a habitable planet zone? Ah, well, right now we're seeing them uh, uh, orbiting around M stars. I'm our small stars about the size of planet Jupiter. Mm -hmm. um, and most of those are not likely to be friendly for life because the stars right. are, are very un active and they send out blasts of material into space. Um, we need a new telescope, much more powerful than what we have, to be able to see uh, an Earth-like planet orbiting around a star like the sun. All right. So ask it again in about 20 or 30 years. We may have an answer for you. Thank you. I, I always had that question because, you know, when I started teaching the course, we didn't have much. But within the time frame of 10 years or so, many showed up, uh, like the Goldilocks planets. Uh, and they have you have to have the right kind of, you know, uh, temperature range uh, and the gravitational uh, power and atmosphere and all these things to make it a Goldilocks planet. Yes. So right now we think about 20% of stars have a Goldilocks zone where the planet's the right size and temperature. Right. We don't know anything yet about atmosphere. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you all for your, for your thinking with me and uh, best of luck in your explorations and uh, and um anis thanks for inviting me it was oh, fun i am i'm so fortunate uh, that you uh, were so kind to accept the invitation and spend the time with us we are uh, lucky and honored and uh, we we hope that this this tradition continues uh, um, um uh, i i met uh, lee feinberg as well so maybe he wow yeah, uh, he 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 might be our next guest, but we, we, we're trying. We're, we're pursuing him. <laughs> yet. Okay, excellent. Uh, he's wonderful. So anyway, thanks again for inviting me. It was a pleasure to talk with you. Thank oh, you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bangladesh. 
Yeah. Dr. Mate, Thank you. And here is the Bangladesh. British Bangladeshi. British <laughs> Bangladeshi <laughs> physicist turned accountant, and now I'm coming back to physics. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Many thank successful you. adventures. Bye-bye. Oh, thank bye -bye. you all. Bye -bye. We'll see you soon again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.